Live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube covering OpenStack Summit 2017. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation, Red Hat, and additional ecosystem support. And we're back. I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host, John Troyer. Happy to welcome back to our program, Chris Wright, who's the Vice President and Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Back-to-back -back -back weeks uh, here in Boston. Uh, right. You've been up on stage on uh, kind of a couple, couple crowds. Uh, Chris, what's, what's new with you? Well, right now I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> I don't know about the two weeks in a row of big summits, but uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time uh, talking about what we're doing with combination of OpenStack and, and containerized platforms, like for us that's OpenShift, built, you know, built around Kubernetes. And so that's a big piece that's new, something that I'm focused on, and you know, a lot of areas that touches into how do these components, or, or how do the technologies go together as, yeah. as components, and yeah. you know, new technologies. I think that's a great topic. I, I saw like these tweets coming into it, and it was like the Kubernetes and OpenStack sandwich, and <laughs> do you eat one without the other? Do I really need this one? Does you know containers and Kubernetes, it's been a discussion for a couple years, does that obviate the need for OpenStack? Uh, I think we know Red Hat's position, but maybe you can help tease that out for us a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important to think about what task are you solving? What what job are you, are Jobs you, to be are you done, trying right? to do? Yeah, and, <laughs> and in that context, pick the right tool for the job. And so there's, there is this reality, which is infrastructure exists, and you need software to help manage that infrastructure. And I think uh, we've put a lot of, as a community, we've put a lot into making OpenStack that infrastructure layer. And if you look at it from a, so that's more of an infrastructure ops perspective. If you look at it more top down from the application point of view, You've got application orchestration, uh, and you know, pick a tool, a good tool for that job. And to us, that's Kubernetes. It does a spectacular job of helping build out uh, an application, uh, sort of multi-tiered or microservice-based type architecture, where your goal as an application developer is define what your app needs and just deploy it. And underneath the infrastructure needs to support that. So I think it's important to look at that combination and even look at it as layers. I like to draw an analogy. Back in the day, which wasn't that long ago, uh, we had physical servers, hardware at the bottom, an operating system that creates a layer of abstraction between this heterogeneous hardware environment and uh, an application. Maybe you evolve a little bit, your applications aren't all written in C, you need a higher level language, runtime like Java, Ruby, whatever. Uh, so you, you know, a couple of different layers between the hardware and the and the application. And today we've got your hardware as a data center. You need some infrastructure, hardware level management down at the bottom, and you still need that kind of application, higher level application view of the world, like uh, OpenStack at the bottom and Kubernetes supporting the applications on top. Uh, talk. Let's talk a little bit about applications and about application modernization. If we look at the through line, again, through ancient history, which was only a few years ago, right? The, the beginnings of OpenStack, um, you know, AWS and Amazon were, were a big topic of conversation there. We talked a lot about pets and cattle and kind of got used to the, that metaphor of, of uh, it's, now we talk a little bit more about stateful and stateless, but also in the, in the container conversation, I'm hearing a lot more about stateful applications, about enterprise applications, about containerizing legacy applications, about OpenShift as a platform for all your applications. Right. So is there, um, and we're here in the, specifically in the context of, of uh, OpenStack, OpenStack yeah. Summit, at this point, are there different infrastructures for, um, say, legacy applications and for modern cloud native applications? Can people start to approach them using the same set of tools? Well, it, it's, it's an interesting question because there's, Part of that is what do you want to do with your legacy application? And people always ask me, should I, should I containerize it? I'm like, well, you should ask yourself why. Just just because containers are cool doesn't mean you should immediately jump to containerizing your application. I think what we always are struggling with and is understanding how much can you move forward into these modern kind of paradigms of, of stateless uh, applications and templatizing your your images and really managing your state externally and, and pushing configuration state into the, the application image at runtime versus the, the legacy that we are all very familiar with, which is all that stuff is kind of lumped together. And as you're trying to move forward, one piece that you, that you can benefit from is adding automation around any task, including managing a stateful 
server, which could be a VM or a container, uh, as well as the certainly the, st the stateless pieces. So I look at it from the point of view of how can you get more efficient? Automation is a key to that. And the, you know, the promise of containers as the, the next generation stateless everything is the same discussion we had with cattle versus pets. And we start to realize that you, you have a lot of investment in stateful portions of your application. What you're really trying to do is find the right balance and the bridges between the fast moving new parts of, of your apps and maybe the, the legacy part that could really be the core transaction processing that's running your business. Yeah. Chris, we've seen some maturation of the, of the base technology. Uh, for the last year, we talked about the big tent now, how large it gets. Even this year, there's now the OpenStack days as to you know, all the, uh, you know, everything from Ansible and Cloud Foundry and lots of other pieces. Where do you see is kind of where we are today for the stack and where are some of the interesting areas that, that Red Hat in particular is uh, working to help mature the solution? Well, actually one thing I like is is narrowing some of the focus. Yeah. So the, the I was never a huge fan of Big Tent just in the sense of there's there's a lot of work to be done in that in those core uh, core core projects in, in OpenStack. And then some of the new pieces in term you know, maybe adding security and security infrastructure. Uh, and for us we've spent a lot of time thinking about not just the different services, uh, you know, People ask us, DNS as a service, and and you know, services that expand away from the traditional, basic compute storage network. Some of those are really critical. Uh, some of those I think might be better served closer, closer to the application. Um, but we really are thinking a lot about how we can do not just deployments, but also the the day two operations of the platform. So now you're building out a big distributed system, and what is the most efficient and cost effective way to manage that infrastructure? That, to me, I think is interesting, uh, and it's, you've, you've heard it for a while, about maybe OpenStack is a scale-out web app that we could run as containerized services and manage it with the container orchestration platform. Uh, those kind of things, I think, are, are interesting because it starts to uh, really leverage what's the best tool for the job, and again, if you, if you want to bring in outside the open source days, bring in outside projects as kind of sister projects, I think that's a great way to do it. So do not, we don't have to bring everything under the same big tent. You know, let people specialize and, and excel. Yeah, absolutely. Something we've we've heard quite a bit is right with the, too much air under the big tent. Uh, like I said, <laughs> need to you know narrow down a little what we're saying. Um, maturing some of those core pieces. You, you mentioned security. Um, I feel like since I started coming here, you know, four years ago, Neutron always, you know, requires some t tightening of the knobs and, uh, you right. know, pulling things down. Um, any place particular you think that we've made good progress in the last year? Anything we should highlight or uh, things that we still the community needs to, you know, nail to make this even better? One thing I'm excited about is in Neutron, uh, one of the things that we built in Neutron was a collection of different agents that make up a uh, essentially an SDN controller that was the, the, the default choice for Neutron, which is ML2 OVS. Uh, and it's served us well, it's gotten us this far, it's built around OVS as the virtual switching layer, but definitely add, brought in some complexity and you know, it, took while, it took a while for it to, to really get to the maturity level that it's at now. Um, relatively, in relatively short order, we built something in the OVS community that centralizes uh, some of that logic and, and uh, configuration data storage around virtual network topology management, created a consistent single agent that sits next to OVS and have a very uh, simplified plugin in the, on the Neutron side. And that's something that we're going to bring, you know, we're, we're working at how can we bring that into our platform and help simplify the picture. And it's not a, really a kind of sexy thing with a bunch of new features. It's really about keep it simple, get the expertise from the right communities, and you know, kind of, that, I think that's an important well, way to look we, at I it. I think we tried uh, the last couple of years, uh, some of us made comments, it's a good thing when some of the basic building blocks are boring, yeah, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Customers, you know, IT departments don't like risk, boring, sometimes keep my job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, speaking to that, I mean, hey, simple is very sexy. So. 
Uh, can you speak at all to kind of maintainability, operability, uh, upgradeability, kind of day two and, and beyond uh, at OpenStack? That was always, in the early days, right, that was, a, that was a concern. People thought you had to bring together a bunch of computer scientists to even run, the, run it, which wasn't necessarily true then. I, my, my take on it from talking to people here, not, not true today. We're getting good feedback from our customers that it's, you know, it, it, I like to remind people, you are building a, a distributed system, so you, <laughs> it, that, there's com inherent complexity in that, but, um, and some of the challenges associated with that are understanding how transactions flow through that system and then, then the associated debugability, and if you've got uh, kind of hard to pin down performance issues or things like that, you need the right tooling. So part of that's just getting the right data out of the infrastructure, call that uh, logging, telemetry, monitoring, uh, and so building that into the platform I think is important and getting the right uh, data out of the platform so you can do analysis I think is, is really where we are now. And so first it was just get it deployed. We're, we're well past that and now it's get it deployed, get it up and get it running. Forward, uh, rolling it forward and doing rolling updates, something that we've spent a lot of time at Red Hat focused on both in the community and then in our products. So 100% important and one of the things I like to uh, talk about is we, we think of it from the point of view of the customer, and we don't want to create unnecessary change or backwards incompatible change that they can't move forward. So we're always lo looking at a measured uh, kind of strategic set of, of changes and evolution so that we can bring our customers forward as this technology changes. Speaking to, the, say, the community for a bit, this is actually my first summit. Uh, been a watcher from afar, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to see here in Boston uh, this year. Uh, you know, the tech track has been split off a little bit, but even here, I see uh, very enthusiastic folks. Still, very feels very much like a community. Lots of uh, T-shirts and branded swag, and, and you know, people proclaiming people uh, proclaiming that they're they're open stackers. Um, can you comment a lot at all on the evolution of the community over the years, kind of where you see it now? It, the other thing I'm struck by is real-world deployments, right? I've, I've, I, this is not just a bunch of vendors getting together. There are actual people here who are implementers. Yeah, that's right. So, first of all, I love the community. It's a good, it's a high-energy place. Um, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I spent a lot of time in the open source communities. And one of the things I loved about OpenStack from the beginning was that, that energetic feeling that you get being surrounded by a bunch of other people who are passionate about the same subject as you. And the you know, formats change a little bit. We don't have the same uh, like by design overlap of the development developers summit and the more project-wide, industry-wide uh, OpenStack summit. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of engineers here and developers. And it doesn't mean we've kind of lost our soul and we're only over here focused in the, the business vacuum. Uh, and I think that's part testament to just the community and the, and the, the type of uh, people who are involved uh, across the board, both on the, the more developer side and on the business side. And then something that I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, it's important to stress that this is a vibrant community, building real platforms that are really helping companies change how they run their businesses. Uh, and you know, it's not only private cloud, that's what primarily what we focus on, but OpenStack also gets used to build out public cloud, so it's, it's a growing growing kind of market as well. Yeah, I, I wonder if you have any commentary on just the people that still help build it. I mean, one of the things I always loved in the early days is there were a lot of the users. Uh, you know, NASA started at the beginning, right. many companies here. When you pull up Stackalytics, you know, the other category is still the biggest. Uh, you know, Red Hat is the largest corporate entity that, that has employees there, but as on the outside, people are like, oh, well, you know, HP took all their stuff and moved it over to SUSE, and certain companies come in and out. Uh, the people building it, um, any comment on how that's changed over the last few years? Uh, I think that you're always going to get a few core vendors that are going to be able to do the deepest investments, and uh, that's certainly an important part, but you also need that long tail, and that's inclusive of uh, other companies that are providing support and services around the platform and then people who are building it themselves and, and deploying it themselves in their companies. And when I talked to some of the foundation folks, they really like to highlight that kind of diversity of people involved in the community. And uh, my experience is without a great breadth of, of diversity, a really diverse community, projects just aren't as dynamic and ultimately could stagnate. So here I see we have got good diversity both 
uh, you know, deployers, implementers, operators, as well as developers across the board from vendors and internal kind of DIY shops. And that's, that's critical to the health yeah, of the community. You can see some open source projects, in my opinion, kind of get caught up in the contributor community only. And they kind of, uh, the danger is you, you don't want to lose track of the operator community, which is, can be people who are contributing, but, you know, is can be much broader, especially as the platform matures, right? Well, and, and it's even, I mean, I could pick on your language for, for a moment. Sure, it's one sure. of these semantic things. Contribution comes in so many forms. So I think it's fair to say people often conflate contributor and developer or code committer. But a contribution is a bug report. Contribution contribution is documentation, a contribution is explaining to us why this is a difficult mm -hmm. workflow. Uh, so there's a, a lot of different ways that to, to consider a contribution, and we actually need all those. A com community isn't just developers, it's developers and users, and the value is that we're close together and we're working directly. There's not a lot of barriers through you know, commercial agreements and things like that to bring together both users and, and developers. There's so much change going on in the industry. We talked about containers some. Uh, we were talking to Lou earlier about serverless. Would love your take on that. But how do you make sure that people stay focused enough to work on those things that need to get done and aren't just working off on the, the next new shiny? The new shiny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think Squirrel. <laughs> we, we touched on that a little earlier with just that um, boring. There, there's value in boring. And so uh, you know, we, we, we serve an enterprise customer base, and they're really looking for stability. And there's big challenges in building out systems uh, and maintaining their stability without getting distracted by the next new shiny object. Uh, and so part of what we do as a company is help our customers consume change in a measured, safe, sort of stable way, um, which means at the same time that we're investing in the core platforms, we're also looking forward and looking ahead and, and understanding what's next. And so we were early investors in the container space, um, we're absolutely looking at serverless ourselves to, to understand uh, what's the value of that, and it comes back to the customer. What do they need? What do they get from that? Um, simplifying operations is a, is a core theme and where we've been going from you own the entire server as a, as a pet or special snowflake to all you care about is, is your business logic and your lines of code and everything else is managed for you in, in the sort of function as a service or serverless environment. I, that's a trend that I think will continue, uh, but we can't forget the layers that we're building, and they have to be stable. We don't want everybody to be distracted by, by new shiny. All right. Chris, as, as you look forward, what's exciting you moving to the next summit? We still have kind of the six month release, which I think they've modified a little bit, but as we, as we look forward, what, what are you looking forward to? Well, I think we're seeing a continued uh, strong relationship between the container community and the OpenStack community, or the Kubernetes community and the OpenStack community. And that's something that I look forward to continuing to get to the point where we actually have joint projects that we're looking at together. We've got Courier already in OpenStack that's a way to, to simplify networking uh, for contain, container networking on top of OpenStack. Um, there's also work in the uh, hardware accelerator space. So how do you in enable GPUs or FPGAs for highly specialized workloads? We talk a lot to labs like uh, uh, the Oak Ridge Lab that we recently announced. And you know, those are HPC type environments where virtualization always sounded like a penalty. And if you can create the right runtime environment uh, that might include this uh, GPUs or FPGAs for uh, you know, highly efficient vector processing, you start to untap a, a a new world of users, uh, or tap into a new world of users, and we know that machine learning is really also getting a lot of hype and interest right now. Uh, it's going to be an important workload on top of OpenStack. We already see that with some of our users. They're, they're, they're using uh, machine learning to help build out their applications. We're also seeing uh, those kind of things put into the public cloud. Uh, yes, those kind of right. GPUs and, and right. uh, add-on processors. So, this idea of a homogenous sea of x86 servers that uh, you know that turns out the cloud is a little more interesting than that. It's a, the cloud has a little more features than just that uh, it, endless it's great. Wait, John, next yeah. you're going to tell me hardware matters again. <laughs> well, it, it, hardware does, always it does. Matters. It's a, it does. It's, it's a sickly. great starting know, point to, to make yeah. it to simplify it, make hom make it homogenous, uh, and then that addresses some significant portion of the market. And then you look at, well, okay, there's a bunch of other needs out there. And so one of the projects we're working on with Massachusetts Open Cloud is looking at how can you do specialized clouds. And 
that's hpc is one example machine learning or big data analytics platforms is another example that's i think interesting and it does maybe it helps expose some of the features and hardware that are evolving and you're not just looking at a you know plain old vanilla platform yeah although they're so they're obviously there's open stack based public clouds a lot of the deployment is open stack based private cloud of course there's still the big the big two or three or four you know public clouds that are that are going on how do you see uh, both app open stack and your customers um, I don't know, embracing this kind of multi-cloud hybrid world. What's what's the model? Are there are there separate stacks for separate clouds? Are people does 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 the Kubernetes and OpenShift then become the the peanut butter that spreads over everything? Uh, We're seeing a lot of success with our customers with that the peanut butter analogy. Um, so it's it is that's why I, I, I kind of liken it to that hardware operating system, higher level language like Java and application, where Java was the the, the portability layer. Uh, here I, I see simil similarities with uh, that picture and Kubernetes and, and application orchestration done with containers as that, that a way to create, uh, whether it's portability or at least consistent runtime environment so that your operations teams and your developers are using the same tools independent of that underlying infrastructure, which I think, uh, you know, again, the infrastructure doesn't go away. Somebody somewhere is managing it, uh, whether it's off-prem in the public cloud, or whether it's on-prem. The other thing that we see with our with our customers is um, public cloud is a very real part of their their strategy, uh, as is on-premise. Depends on the workload, and public cloud is never which public cloud provider do I pick? It's which public cloud providers am I working with? So it is a, a complex environment and, and having consistency across that complex environment I think really helps uh, both developers and ops teams. All right, well, Chris Wright, we're going to have to leave it there. Always appreciate having the conversation with you uh, at, at all the events and uh, glad you got to have two weeks of Boston. <laughs> uh, you know, we'd love to do some more CUBE events uh, over in, in the Portland area. Uh, with, that was the first open stack that the CUBE did. Uh, oh, so okay. thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back uh, getting towards the end of day one of three days of live coverage. Thanks for watching the CUBE.